Allie is originally from New Hampshire. She went to the School of Northeastern University in Boston, where she received her doctorate in, in ther physical therapy. Um, she specializes in pelvic health for the past five years, and last year received her pelvic rehab practitioner certification, which means that she has a additional certification to designate someone who specializes in pelvic rehab for all populations. Uh, she enjoys things that are outdoors, and, and she's a foodie, mostly because her mom was a chef. So we're grateful that she could spend this time uh, with us tonight. I'm going to share, allow you to share your screen, okay. Alan. Let's see. It still says I can't share it. Okay, try it now. There we go. There you go. explaining what pelvic floor physical therapy is because um, not a lot of people really know what it is or what we do um, and even if people are aware that it is a thing they don't actually know what happens when we treat patients. Um, I had done a presentation for some urologists and they refer to PT all the time but really had no idea what actual sessions consisted of um, so I figured out I'd do a little brief overview of what we actually do. Um, so pelvic floor physical therapy is the treatment of the pelvic floor muscle group, which is responsible for a variety of functions, um, including um, bowel and bladder control. They contribute to sexual arousal and orgasm. They also provide a lot of support for our pelvis and lumbar spine. Uh, they're involved in breathing and they kind of form just the base of what helps us be a physically stable individual. Um, both males and females have pelvic floors. Most men aren't aware of that. So it's one thing that I usually try to, again, kind of let people know is just because uh, someone might not have a vagina doesn't mean that they don't have a pelvic floor. And um, we'll go back. Um, so again, kind of talking about this, pelvic for PTT is not just for females. Um, there was a literature review done in 2014 that um, showed that treat, or pelvic floor treatment for male pelvic floor disorders was found to be a cost-effective and non-invasive uh, non first treatment option for multiple conditions, including stress urinary incontinence, overactive bladder syndrome, um, post void dribbling, erectile dysfunction, ejaculatory dysfunction, and then pelvic floor tension myalgia, which is essentially pelvic floor muscle pain. Um, conditions that I typically treat um, for both males and females uh, are, again, urgent, uh, urinary urgency, frequency, incontinence, pelvic or abdominal pain, painful in intercourse, premature or painful ejaculation, um, painful orgasm should be also in there, um, erectile dysfunction, Usually that's kind of in conjunction with different disorders, um, constipation or fecal incontinence. And just to kind of also go over what a typical session is when people come in to see us, um, it's not just looking at the actual pelvic floor itself. We kind of take a whole body approach to it because there are so many different contributing factors. So um, a typical first session involves usually a lot of talking um, trying to figure out exactly when the condition started, what we're kind of seeing them for, um, what their diet habits are like, what their exercise habits like, um, it, whether there's any other factors going on in their life that might be contributing to it. We take a look at their range of motion, mobility, strength, what their breathing mechanics are like, what their posture is like, um, and then usually the latter portion of it is when we do the actual pelvic floor assessment 
And that's also one of the things that I usually try to be very careful when it comes to language is we're not doing a pelvic exam, we're assessing. So we're, what we're assessing is how those muscles function. We want to look at how well they contract, how well they relax, if there's any significant muscle tone, what muscles might be painful, um, and, and then kind of can come up with a good plan of care from that point. Um, when it comes to working with patients that have a history of sexual abuse, um, it is a similar process. However, at that time, or at the time that anyone is treating pelvic floor disorders, we usually have a pretty good, um, a pretty good education and know how to work with patients that have had previous histories of um, abuse and that whatnot in their history. So um, that's usually one thing that I try to be very gingerly with when it comes to um, internal assessments, because again, some people might not be super comfortable with that. It might be kind of triggering. So while it's important to get a good oversight and a good view of what's going on. It's not something that necessarily needs to happen right away. Um, and there are a lot of other things that we can do to work with patients on that um, if that's something that they're not super comfortable with doing in the first session. Um, so while when it comes to prevalence of pelvic pain and victims of sexual abuse or trauma, um, it might not be specific to the victims of sex trafficking, but many studies have looked at the effect of um, sexual and emotional trauma on the pelvic floor muscles, as well as um, the effect on the digestive system and digestive disorders, bladder, urinary problems in both females and males. Um, overall, there unfortunately is not a lot of research kind of looking at PT in particular to treating a lot of these issues. Um, a lot of the research tends to be case studies, which are super individualized. And I think that's also part of the problem is that when it comes to pelvic floor, regardless of what you're treating, A, no PT is going to treat the same, and B, it's very hard to kind of um, come up with a very standardized way of treating just because no, patient, no two patients are going to be alike, whether they have the same diagnosis to start with. Um, so to do an actual randomized control study would probably not work out super well. Um, however, there is some research. Um, most of it's not like the best, but we'll go through kind of what I found um, that helped or to give some sort of backing and reasoning for kind of what we do. So when it comes to digestive orders um, and gastroenterology problems, there was a literature review done um, and it was, you know, they had referenced a study where they looked at 206 patients that were seen in a gastroenterology practice. 44% of um, reported a history of sexual and physical abuse as a child. So they found a pretty significant correlation of um, gastroenterology problems and digestive disorders in a population that has had some abuse in the past. And it doesn't have to be um, recent. It can, and more often it's not, especially by the time I end up seeing patients. And then this uh, next study was done in 2012, and it was actually looking at not necessarily the frequency of these disorders in their patients, but at how often gastroenterologists inquired about sexual abuse when they were assessing patients. Um, only 4.7% routinely asked female patients and 0.6% asked male patients. Um, and that was just before their general, um, their general sessions. And then prior to performing a colonoscopy, the numbers were even lower with women. So it was 2.4% and still the 0.6% for men. Um, However, when patients presented with abdominal pain and fecal incontinence, that went up a little bit and um, they would usually ask 68% of females and 27% of men. And in the study, they state, and pretty much every study that I found regarding more so um, whether physicians were asking about these problems, 
the reason for not asking is because they said they didn't feel comfortable, they weren't given enough education um, on A, how to address the subject, and B, that any sort of abuse could factor into physiologically how their patients were doing and their symptoms. Um, so if nothing else, it kind of shows that as healthcare professionals having increased education based on kind of what the mental emotional state when it comes to sexual abuse can actually present physically would be very helpful. Um, the next one is gonna be looking at the urological conditions um, and sexual problems. These are usually kind of more of the issues that I end up seeing a lot of the time. And um, one, the first one was looking at the frequency during which urological nurses inquired about sexual abuse with patients. Thankfully, this was a little bit higher than with gastro. 6.5% um, always asked, 44% um, asked often with female patients. Male patients still a little bit lower, 4.3% always asked and 36.3% often asked. Um, the main reason again for not asking in both cases was insufficient knowledge as to how to address sexual abuse with either population. Um, the next study looked at the correlation between urinary tract symptoms, gastro and um, intestinal symptoms, and sexual dysfunction with a history of sexual abuse in, patient, in female patients. And 23% reported a history of sexual abuse. And then 83% of those patients experienced multiple issues. Um, so not only one of the symptoms of the pelvic floor dysfunction, but usually at least two to three um, versus 48% in the population that didn't have a history of abuse. So it's almost double. Um, the next one was a literature review again that was just looking at the role of pelvic floor um, muscles and sexual dysfunction in both males and females. And it found that skilled and properly trained physical, uh, pelvic floor physical therapists played an integral role in the treatment of sexual dysfunction. It really gave no uh, real idea as to kind of what they were doing. Um, it was more just showing that most patients did better in most of their outcome measures when it came to um, seeing a physical therapist. Um, the next one is again kind of something that is more common with pelvic pain patients again is a correlation to various psychiatric diagnoses. Um, the study looked at 55 women with and 25 had chronic pelvic pain, 30 had various other OBGYN conditions. Um, they found the patients with chronic pelvic pain had a higher prevalence of major depression, substance abuse, sexual, um, adult sexual dysfunction, somatization, and a history of adult and childhood sexual abuse. Um, and this is something that I think I find quite often with a lot, again, a lot of my patients that have some have had these issues for years is you're usually they also have some other um, psychiatric diagnosis. A lot of times it can be anxiety and depression related. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the anxiety and depression cause the pelvic pain, or it could be the pelvic pain cause the anxiety and depression. Um, because again, when it comes to pelvic floor disorders, when we're talking about our bowel and bladder habits, our sexual habits, um, issues in that department can be really detrimental when it comes to a patient's mental state. Um, so if you're dealing with a patient that has a history of abuse, it can also kind of compound those, um, those issues and increase that as well. And um, part of that can also be, again, when it comes to the mental health connection to the pelvic floor, there's a pretty strong connection with um, via the vagus nerve, which is one of our largest nerves in our body. It's part of the autonomic nervous system and that kind of regulates our fight or flight and our rest and digest. And with increased, whether it's stress, anxiety, tension, increased pain even, that's gonna upregulate our sympathetic nervous system, which is our, again, our kind of fight or flight 
And when that happens, that we also notice increase in um, blood pressure, heart rate, there's usually increased muscle tone, which again, if you have an underlying pelvic floor issue can also increase pelvic pain and then kind of get stuck in that pain, feed, uh, pain feedback loop. And it just kind of continues to um, go. And then next, so talking about the role of pelvic floor PT and kind of the rehab process. Um, treatment can vary patient to patient. Various techniques are used um, in combination, including manual therapy, biofeedback, breathing strategies, relaxation techniques, pelvic floor and core strengthening, and then bladder retraining. I find that um, if people do know about pelvic floor rehab, they assume that it's mostly all biofeedback, um, which it can be partially, but a lot of times, especially these days, as um, there is more research, there is more training, people tend to be actually leading further away from biofeedback um, and leading more on various other techniques because while it's very helpful in the beginning, um, it's not something that can be realistically transitioned into something to do at home or in a normal daily practice. So part of what I focus on, again, kind of with all of my patients that do have any type of history of pelvic pain, regardless of whether there's that um, abuse history, is the importance of breathing and pelvic floor down training. So when we do have a stressful event in our history, regardless of whether it's sexual or emotional, um, a lot of people, just like you can hold tension in your neck, tend to hold tension in their pelvic floor and not really notice it mostly because we can't really see those muscles. If we have tension in our necks or in our shoulders, we'll get tension headaches. You can have your shoulders way up by your ears. Pelvic floor is a little bit different. And most people don't really pay attention to what's happening down there. They just notice if, oh, maybe I have to go uh, urinate more often. Maybe it's harder for me to have a bowel movement. And all of those symptoms can lead to, meaning that there's probably some increased tension in those pelvic floor muscles. So working on breathing mechanics and postural stuff is super helpful to start with. Um, it can help to a reduce just overall muscle tension and tone through the pelvic floor. It also helps to coordinate the rest of our muscles that are part of our deep core stabilizers to work together. Um, it's one of the things that I think makes the, is kind of the biggest bang for your buck right off the bat. And again, it kind of helps us tap into our parasympathetic nervous system and really decrease that kind of fight or flight uh, stress reaction and get more into the rest and digest and try to release and relax some of that muscle tone. Here we talk about biofeedback. So what a, a biofeedback is for people that aren't familiar with it is it's a, um, it involves various types of sensors. So for pelvic floor, we can do an internal sensor for either vaginal or rectum. There's also um, external sensors that are basically these little electrodes that you see down on the bottom of the screen. And what those do, the electrodes would go externally on either side of the anus, essentially, which is your external anal sphincter. And that's the outer most uh, easily accessible muscle of your pelvic floor. And with regardless of whether it's the internal sensor or the external, you don't really feel anything from them. They're just kind of there to measure. And what they're measuring is the electrical activity that your muscles make. So anytime that there's muscle contraction, we have that action potential that creates electrical charge. And these basically measure that. And then that little machine and those sensors are then set up to some sort of a screen, whether it's an iPad, a computer, or just the um, actual handheld biofeedback device. So the reason it's very helpful for pelvic floor is again, since we don't have that visual, we can't tell what's actually happening with those muscles. This can kind of help give us that reading and give us that visual connection. So it is really helpful for patients that don't really have that awareness you can tell how well you can contract those muscles and how well you can relax them. And if 
you, we start off with a really high reading on the device, meaning that those muscles are already really tight. Then we can work on some deep breathing exercises some relaxation techniques, and you can usually see that muscle tone drop. It's also really good for um, reason, I like using this again for pelvic pain patients or patients that have had that history of abuse is it's non-invasive if you use the external sensors and it also is a really great way to help keep patients present during the session and that's one of the things that I think they I've found and I've had and they talk about in just general treatment forums is that for patients that do have that um, history of sexual or emotional abuse but when it comes to working with the pelvic floor they tend to kind of disassociate um, and it's a part of a coping mechanism that we try to work with and bringing them closer in and present to the situation so they can really kind of feel what's happening there um, and start to create more of a positive relationship to the pelvic floor versus whatever negative relationship they may have had in the past. Um, and then the last slide is actually, again, another research study that um, I always, this is one of my favorite things to bring up because I would venture to say about 75% of my male patients that come in with various pelvic floor disorders, whether it's pelvic pain, um, erectile dysfunction, testicular pain, scrotal pain, um, almost all of them have been treated at some point during the process for chronic prostatitis, um, mainly because I think regardless of what physician they end up seeing, a lot of times if there's a issue when it comes to pain in the genital region for males, they assume that it has to do with their prostate. Um, when now research is showing that um, more often than not, there's no issue with the prostate. There is not an active infection. It's usually an issue with the pelvic floor and the muscles of the pelvis. Um, so the study had 10 men with chronic pelvic pain and were, that had been given the diagnosis of prostatitis. They completed 10 visits of PT. Five out of 10 had a reduction in pain scores that equated to a robust response. I don't really know what that meant, um, but it sounded good. And based on their preliminary research results, believe that pelvic floor PT um, is a viable option for many patients. And more often than not, I see a lot of my male patients do very, very well with treatment. Um, and it's unfortunate that majority of the time it's uh, they've been doing various things over the course of a couple of years with no resolve or they've seen someone that's like, oh, uh, here's a bunch of antibiotics or here's a bunch of Almiron, which is another medication they use for blood, uh, interstitial cystitis, which is a bladder condition. Um, and with that, whether it, they don't have any results, um, it's usually just take more or I'm sorry, there's really nothing else we can do. Um, so for, uh, from a healthcare practitioner standpoint, that's always very frustrating. So I always like to kind of bring that up when it comes to pelvic floor um, talks. And so again, in kind of conclusion, the reason that my main goal for this presentation was to bring, um, bring to awareness that pelvic floor physical therapy can be, can be and should be considered um, as a viable treatment option in the process for sexual abuse and trafficking victims. It can provide um, really useful treatment and help for patients in an area that a lot of people don't necessarily um, think of when it comes to that. Um, the nice part too is again, it's non-invasive non for whether it's bladder dysfunction, bowel dysfunction, pelvic pain, or any of the above. Um, patients tend to do really well with it because again, it, it's it can be helpful to at least have someone sit down and kind of go over the muscular components of it. And I find that when you kind of explain that type of situation and go over that, okay, there's a connection between what you're feeling and like an actual muscular dysfunction, it can kind of be a big relief for a lot of people that might think that either this is 
being caused by whether it's a mental health disorder or there's no reason they're just kind of broken in that sense. Um, and yeah, it can be very, very helpful for a lot of people. Um, any questions? Ali, I want to start with a question. Um, of, of the patients that you see um, that that you see that there's a connection to uh, previous abuse, how many of them have been off, been able to address that or get mental health support to go with the other treatments? Um, I would venture to say when it comes to the patients that I see that have a more recent um, history of abuse tend to have ongoing mental health care for that as well. The patients that have like past childhood abuse or um, even like assault that may have happened when in their 20s and they're now in their 60s and they're like, yeah, but it wasn't a big deal. Um, However, we can kind of correlate the beginning of some symptoms to that standpoint. And I find that those patients typically haven't had the appropriate mental health care to go along with that, um, if that answers your question. So it's about half and half. Um, this is Kanani. Mm -hmm. uh, that was an amazing and wonderful presentation. So thank you so much for for doing that um, and for providing us with this knowledge, Allison. Um, it certainly cleared up some of my misconceptions about um, pelvic floor therapy. Um, I was wondering, um, I certainly, as you know, had no knowledge that this could be done with men, although it makes perfect mm -hmm. sense that it could. Um, I was wondering if you know how insurance companies work with pelvic floor therapy and if insurance is ever a problem. Um, or I shouldn't say ever, because of course it sometimes is, but if it's often right. a problem? Um, so that is a, it, it can go either way. These days, um, most insurances will cover treatment for pelvic floor disorders. I haven't had an insurance company that won't cover it. Um, the hard part is because, so for example, the, the clinic that I'm part of, we don't take HMOs or like Medicaid type insurance plans. So that makes it difficult. The reason we don't is because our sessions are one-on-one -on -one for an hour, which most, most public sessions are, um, because I feel like it would be useless if we couldn't get that much time, unfortunately. So these days it's very, it's a, it's a very interesting point to be at. Um, a lot of pelvic floor practitioners are going towards a cash pay um, system, which I don't think will, our clinic will ever go there. Um, but it has, we haven't necessarily, for the insurances we accept, haven't had issues with having them pay for that. Um, and we've even had a couple of insurances that if you, if the patient can't find a practitioner that accepts their insurance and they have medical documentation showing that they need this treatment. We have had like one-time contracts with different insurance companies to do so. Um, it used to be a lot more difficult um, to get reimbursed for it, unfortunately, but these days it's a little bit better. Thanks, and then I just have um, a follow-up question. Do you, well actually two, do you see this um, very often in the MSM population? Um, or more often in an MSM population versus a heterosexual male population. Um, and also, I see a number of um, kids who are victims of child abuse, um, and I'm wondering how much this is done in a pediatric population. Um, so yeah, I actually did, uh, when, when was it? Back in June, I think I did a presentation for like an LGBTQ, um, it was a student run organization about pelvic health and um, various communities. And there actually tends to be a much higher rate of sexual abuse and assault um, that's less often talked about. So for example, majority of people within the um, 
heterosexual community, um, it takes women, uh, they say on average, about six years to bring up any type of pelvic floor dysfunction to a, a medical practitioner. Um, men is probably closer to 10. And then within the um, homosexual community, it can, most, more often than not, they tend to not bring it up mostly because of their negative um, interactions with a lot of the medical community. And that was pretty much all of the research that I found. So it was really interesting. Um, but I do find, especially for my male patients, it tends to be about half and half, but I find that the patients that don't identify as um, heterosexual definitely have a higher history of some sort of negative, whether it's emotional or sexual abuse in their history. And, and just the second part of that, how about in kids? Yeah. yeah. So kids, um, it is, so there are people that do specialize in pediatric pelvic health. I, I find that what, at least what I know of locally, more often than not, um, there's not a lot of options and they primarily focus with biofeedback, which isn't a bad thing. Um, when it comes to pediatric populations, um, as a general rule of thumb, we kind of stay away from any sort of internal work, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there can't be manual therapy externally through the pelvis and the abdomen. Um, but if you're talking about pediatrics specifically for like this, uh, like a trauma abuse um, population, I don't know of many. It does exist. Um, and actually, I'm in the process of doing some training for pediatrics because uh, there's not a lot around here. So I figured I had some time during COVID. I might as well <laughs> learn a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it would be very useful in that population, although I do understand the caution just because um, the, with the pediatric, you know, cognitive, neurocognitive abilities to understand exactly what's going on right. might be tricky. Yeah, yeah. It is, it's tricky. It's, uh, it's, I mean, it's tricky with adults as well, so. <laughs> True. <laughs> Hmm. Looks like we have a question in the chat. Okay, uh, let me see if I can get to that. Uh, or let, me read it, let me read it to you. How many sessions would you recommend for adults versus children? And does the duration of experiencing symptoms prior to intervention influence efficacy? Hold on, let me pull up. Um, cool. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can read that. Um, so sessions is a hard one um, because it, especially when it comes to if we're talking about a pelvic pain patient, regardless of whether whether it's an adult versus a child, um, I typically see my patients one to two times a week to start with. And then I've had patients that will decrease frequency to once every once a week, once every other week, once a month. And I've seen patients as short as a month and I've seen patients as long as two years. Um, because again, if it's, if we're talking about a, um, a, a sexual assault victim, again, regardless of whether it's a child or an adult, it, there can be a lot of different layers that play into it. Um, so it, it's, it's hard to say like sessions wise how many it would be. Um, in general, I would say it's probably on average, I see patients for like a six month period of time. And again, it's probably an average of like one to two visits a week. Um, and then the Duration of experiencing symptoms doesn't necessarily pay, uh, play that much into it. Um, it doesn't mean that if you've been, ex well, I should, I take that back. Um, if someone's been experiencing symptoms for a very long time, typically there's a lot more going on than if someone was to just uh, start experiencing symptoms uh, within the last month or so. Um, like I have a lot of patients right now that with being quarantined at home, there's been a 
pretty high increase in stress, anxiety, that sort of stuff. So if it's just been kind of going on for a couple of months, usually it's a little bit easier to work through that versus if you've had someone that's been dealing with this for years and they continue to see practitioners. I actually talked to a um, male trafficking or sex trafficking survivor and he, I mean, he's, his abuse happened in childhood and he's had many years of issues now that have been misdiagnosed or just thought it was a purely gastro condition or a purely urinary condition. Um, and he never, he, I don't think he still had any attempt at being treated by a PT. So if that's the case, then that can take a long time to kind of work with that. Um, I'm just reading the next question in the chat. <laughs> Um, Thanks, Sally. This is really insightful. Yeah. Um, so the, the question in the chat is coming from the ER. I wonder if our MDs have knowledge of this. We are often have patients with repeated same chief complaints as the areas you talked about. How would they facilitate referrals or do these referrals mostly come from primary MD or clinics? Um, referrals can come from anyone, especially uh, when it comes to like insurance wise, if we're talking about someone with a PPO, um, they could even do a self referral. So it doesn't really matter who it comes from at that point. When we're talking about HMOs, that's a little bit different. I don't necessarily know if it needs to come from a primary MD or if it could come from the ER. I would assume ER would be fine. Um, and again, the, the other part of this too is um, Depending on the area that people live in, there's not a lot of pelvic floor therapists out there. Um, and some of them might not always accept insurances. So there is like always the option of cash pay, which depending on the patient population could be um, not reasonable or not an option. However, it is always an option regardless usually of where you're at. Um, and I don't know necessarily if from like, ER's standpoint, what, whether doctors have had knowledge of this, from what I've heard of different physicians I've presented to, um, they have very, they have a little blurb about pelvic floor PT and, and just as like a, you do biofeedback and this is for pelvic floor disorders and not really a lot or much else otherwise. Um, most people often just think it's for like women postpartum, but it's a lot more than that. Ali, um, would you recommend that physicians, whether they're like primary care, urology, gastro, that if they're referring for pelvic floor dysfunction, should they be asking about a history of sexual trauma or, or just, yeah. just emotional abuse? I, w I would, um, absolutely. But again, it's kind of, I think that's something that some people might not outwardly, um, come out with that right off the bat, especially if it's been in the past. Um, I've found that a lot of times it's something that kind of comes up after I've been seeing someone for like a few sessions. Um, and if that's the case, and if they haven't really had any outside assistance with that, then we have, um, I have a whole slew of resources to give patients um, if that's something they need help with. But I think it's not a bad idea for them to ask right off the bat before, especially for um, someone that does have like multiple complaints or multiple issues in the pelvic area. These are great questions. Any other questions? Is it okay if we share um, your slides and your contact information? Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you do you have my contact info, Amy? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So I'll include that in the minutes. Okay, perfect. We really appreciate those. Of um, I'm gonna I'm gonna just put in the chat box again. Please please sign Allie's thank you note. 
the link for it is right there. And if you haven't yet, please fill out the attendance form so that you get credit for joining us tonight. So I'm just going to go ahead and stop recording. Perfect.